How do you have the building of the whole Mexico and something like me? That's an obvious thing. There's a million ways I can ask somebody. Birmingham was a fine place to live, with plenty of business opportunities. We soon made many friends. And my father became a prominent member of the local Quaker community. Because of our religious friends, Quakers were considered to be non conformist This prevented us from studying at university. And as a result, we were unable to enter the professions, such as medicine and war. Also, because, because of pacifists, we couldn't join the army or navy. And so trade and commerce were the only areas where Quakers could focus their ambitions and prosper. I was apprenticed as a teenager in Leeds, and then worked in a bonded tea house in London. When I returned to Birmingham in 1824, I borrowed some money from my father to go into business as a tea dealer at a cotton grocery and took over the shop and installed this large plate glass window so that my customers could see the samples of tea, coffee, and cocoa nibs that I prepared myself. My colorful window displays soon attracted new customers from far and wide. And even a a fully costumed Chinese man to help serve the shop. Oh, yes. He caused a lot of interest. And with him, I'm in the shop. I started to experiment, manufacturing my own cocoa and chocolate and the sun I was You see, I noticed that a fashion of people were drinking cocoa, chocolate, and coffee beans. These drinks were considered as wholesome alternatives to alcohol, which we as Quakers strongly disapproved. And so as my business began to prosper, I was able to attract fashionable customers to buy my goods and see the colorful displays in my shop window. In my spare time, I experimented with preparations of cocoa beans and chocolate, which I could sell in the shop. Soon I had to rent a warehouse in nearby Crooked Lane, where I could manufacture these products on a larger scale. At first, it was very difficult, because I had to pay high taxes on the cocoa beans, and then, on top of all that, I had to move out of Crooked Lane and into another factory here in Bridge Street. That's what my brother Benjamin told me, and together we formed Cadbury Brothers. With more space, we could now prepare a cocoa powder and an eating chocolate that could be packed and sold. Soon after, my eldest son, Richard, joined the company. Having Richard with us made all the difference. He saw to it that the quality of our cocoa improved, introduced new products, and even opened a shop in London. Our efforts were rewarded when we received our first oil warrant from Queen Victoria. That was when my younger son, George, joined us. George introduced many benefits for the workforce, such as half-day holidays, a sick club, and many improvements in the factory. And Richard, your new designs for our packaging were a huge success. Well, we had to try something different, just to get ourselves recognized, Father, as we were still a small company. I remember it was a struggle, but with everyone's hard work, we managed to turn things around. Our aim was to manufacture only the highest quality cocoa and chocolate. I know, but I could tell you some stories of less scrupulous producers who added brick dust to that cocoa. Ours was still gritty, but we only added sugar to take away the bitter taste and starch to absorb the fat. However, George had heard of a new kind of cocoa press. He went to Holland in 1866, saw the press being used and brought one back. The Van Houten Press. Oh yes, Father. You see, because we could extract more of the cocoa butter, there was no need for more additives. Not only was our, our cocoa essence more palatable, but also output increased. We became the only company in England that could produce such a pure cocoa essence. We advertised and were praised in medical journals who approved the benefits of our product. Our cocoa essence sales increased and our eating chocolate became even more popular. The Bridge Street factory was now too small to cope and we had to expand somewhere else. For some time, George and I had shared the same vision to build our new factory in a garden setting, away from the smoke and grime of the city. If the country was a good place to live in, then why not to work there? We found a rural site surrounded by farmland 
that was just four miles south of the city, that was close to a canal and railway line. We called our new factory Bourneville, after the Bourne stream that ran through the land. And Ville, after the fashion for naming anything in the French style. We opened our new factory in 1879 and were faced with many more challenges as the size of our workforce increased. I'm proud that you both have the courage to hold on to our beliefs and continue to treat your employees as though they were part of the family. Well, you showed us that management could share the responsibility of running the factory by working hand in hand with the workforce. The improvements that you made in the working conditions in the new factory and the benefits you offered your employees were way ahead of their time. Times were changing, Father. Why should we allow our workers to live and work in appalling conditions just because that's what other employers did? As the company prospered, we introduced bonuses such as payment for output and punctuality, a five and a half day week, pension schemes, works committees, training, and many other benefits. What about recreation for our people? We built swimming pools, gymnasiums, football and cricket pitches, and organized works outings. And you'd started to develop Bourneville Village. You see, our vision was to create a community around the factory with decent homes and, and space to live so that our employees could enjoy a fuller life. As the company grew and our sons joined the business to take over the day-to-day -day management, George was able to devote more time to developing Bourneville Village. We bought more land and built new houses, a hospital, schools, churches, and many other facilities, not just for our employees, but for the whole community. As we approached the 20th century, we launched many new brands, including assortments and fancy chocolates. I sent my son George to Switzerland to find out how chocolate was made using fresh milk. Soon after, Cadbury were able to manufacture chocolate with a much higher milk content that rivaled even the best Swiss products. That was when we launched our most important new brand. We called it Cadbury's Dairy Milk. It became so popular with its distinctive taste that sales exceeded all our best expectations. And within a short while, it had become our best-selling chocolate. We now use milk chocolate in a whole new range of products, from Easter eggs to the new selection we called Milk Trade. In 1919, we merged with Fry, and the company went from strength to strength. Through the 20s and 30s, we launched many new products, many of which are still favourites today. Our new glass and a half logo was introduced, and we began using the Cadbury script in all our merchandising. With the outbreak of war in 1939, chocolate production was drastically reduced and rationed, although we were able to maintain supplies to our armed forces. Cadbury also contributed to the war effort in other ways. After the
car mode, whatever filling they wanted. They would pipe in their filling for around eight hours a day, one by one. Once the fillings were added into the chocolate, they would take some hand tempered melted chocolate from earlier and they would place that over their filling. And this was one of the last but most important steps. So if they didn't do this step properly, everything that Jesus just did.
the nibs are now ground up in large mills. This process generates heat, which helps to transform the nibs into a thick chocolate-colored liquid called cocoa liquor, or mass. Cocoa liquor is the basis of all our chocolate and cocoa products. Some cocoa liquor is taken to our factory at Marlbrook for further processing. The rest of the liquor is pressed to extract the cocoa butter. This is achieved using a special cylinder in which the cocoa liquor is compressed under very high pressures so that the cocoa butter is squeezed out and filtered until it's in its purest form. The refined cocoa butter is now taken to Bourneville, where we will catch up with it later. Meanwhile, the cocoa liquor that has been taken to Marlbrook is pumped into storage tanks, ready to be turned into chocolate crumb. Over 150 tonnes of sugar and 500,000 litres of fresh full cream milk are delivered to Marlbrook every day to be used in this process. But first, the milk must be pasteurised and then evaporated to remove most of the water before sugar can be added to produce a sweetened condensed milk. The liquid milk and sugar solution is now heated again before the cocoa liquor from Chirk is added and thoroughly mixed to create a thick paste. The paste is then squeezed between steam heated rollers under a huge vacuum causing the paste to turn into a powder. The resulting crumb is scraped from the rollers, dried in a flow of hot air, and blown into storage silos. The crumb is now taken to Bourneville in tankers, where it is ground and mixed into a paste with this, the cocoa butter, which came from Chirk earlier. The paste is then refined into a flake before being conched or mixed to form a liquid chocolate. This liquid chocolate is used to make all our famous milk chocolate products. Bananas for my furry friend who needs no introduction.